I'd like to welcome to the show Brian Herskowitz. How you doing, brother? So far, so good. Good, man. Thank you, for, thank you for being on the show. I truly appreciate it. We are going to talk some shop today, some screenwriting uh, and, and craft shop today. But before we get into it, how did you get into the business? Well, I started off, I was a, a, a quote unquote child actor um, in Houston, Texas, and did dinner theater. And always had it in my, in my mind that I was going to eventually come out to LA and become an actor. And I did part of that. <laughs> I did come out to LA. Um, and started trying to work as an actor and found that Michael J. Fox had all the short parts rolled up. So I was like, okay, now what do I do? And uh, my father's a writer, um, not a screenwriter, but he's written over 60 books and uh, quite a few bestsellers with people like Gene Tierney and Betty Davis and, um, uh, I don't know, George Bush, a lot of, lot of people that people would have heard. Mm -hmm. And I guess the apple fell sort of next to the tree and I started looking at uh, screenwriting and I was actually um, in my youth and I, I still am a martial artist and I tore my anterior cruciate ligament in the Olympic trials in 1980. Wow. And I spent about nine months in a cast and couldn't couldn't go out on auditions, couldn't really do anything. And I sat down, I said, I have an idea for a screenplay. And I sat down, I wrote it in five days and went, well, this is easy. And... Uh, <laughs> Got an agent and it was optioned a few times. And then I said, I'm going to do another screenplay. And then about 70 pages into that went, I have no clue what I'm doing, not even an inkling and started kind of studying the craft. And then over years developed my own thoughts and process. Very cool. Yeah, it's easy, right? It's just five days. You should knock one out every, yeah. uh, so in that you could like knock that. out four a month easily yeah. with the, and weekends I, off. I, I still do that. And the weekends yeah. off and the weekends yes. off on top of that. Exactly. <laughs> you know how many people I talk to think that that's the way it goes? <laughs> you know, I thought that, hey, you, you're looking at one who did. I, I thought, oh, this is, you know, why haven't I been doing this? It's like going to Vegas. The first time you go to Vegas and you win oh, and you think, oh, why haven't That's, I been gambling my entire life? I won just 400 gonna, bucks. I could do this every day. I'd be a millionaire. You know? And yeah. then you find out that it doesn't quite go that way. Yeah, that's exactly what happened to me when I first gambled when I was like in my teens in a cruise ship. I, I was like – They, I, they I, plan I mean, it that way, I think. I think I, they actually – there's some sort of like – you know there's, Algorithm. There's, <laughs> yeah, or you know, there's smirch or chaos is sitting there going, okay – I think if we get these guys set up so that they think they're going to win, they'll come back and lose their entire life savings. It, so it's because it's, it's, I put in a quarter. I never forgot. I put in four quarters and I was like 16. I was working international. Mm -hmm. I was gambling international waters. Right. I put, and I got up to 60 bucks off of a quarter slot machine. And I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah. I, I'll I just, had a similar experience. I'll maybe. just stay right here until I make it's $1,000. And then when right. I was back down to $5, I, I said, you know what? I think I should <laughs> probably quit uh, i've oh, made see, five times my money i'm good yeah at least you learned it in one in one go it yeah. took me it took me a couple of goes to go oh oh wait a minute you mean you don't win every time what what is that about so. exactly exactly now you you've been in the business for a while and yes. uh uh yes you've been uh, you, just you just just starting out you a little, started, a little uh, bit yeah. yeah and you worked on some really um fun shows back in the day back in, in the 80s uh specifically uh, three that I remember very well was Blossom, mm -hmm. uh, which was was a great, which was a hit, a huge hit uh, as a as a comedy, as a, a yeah. huge hit for I don't know if I forgot what um, network it was on. It was NBC, CBS, CBS. CBS. and then uh, two of my favorite, NBC. two of my favorite eighties action uh, shows, Hercules and yeah. Renegade. Like that's so eighties. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Lorenzo mm -hmm. Lamas, for I mean, God's yeah. sakes, and yeah, uh, it was great. So, how was it working on those kind of hit shows, like in in the in the writers' room? Like, how was it mm -hmm. at, at those times? You know, they were all very different. Mm -hmm. um, Renegade was uh, kind of a one-off, so I was a guest uh, writer on that. Mm -hmm. uh, freelance writer came in, and that was a great experience. But it was really just that show, and then out with Hercules. Um, they had a very and and Renegade also. They were both uh, syndicated shows. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about the syndicated shows is they didn't have the kind of money that you have on the network. So a lot of them really relied upon the freelance writer. Interesting. They'd have a very small staff or, or almost no staff. And they would do most of the shows would be people outside of the office. So on uh, on Hercules, I ended up doing four episodes uh, for them. And then uh, 
kind of spun off to do one of the young Hercules with Ryan Gosling. Oh. People forget that he was young Hercules. Was he young he Hercules? I have to look he was that young up. Hercules. Oh my yeah. God, I have to still look that up. Yeah. <laughs> we don't keep in touch. I don't know. He never calls. He never writes. I don't know what happened. <laughs> we were so close and then nothing. Um, but uh, the Hercules, I loved working on the Hercules series for uh, a myriad of reasons. One, um, you could do virtually anything. They were <laughs> open to just about, you know, I mean, I I wrote some, If I don't know if iconic is quite the word, but I wrote some interesting episodes. I wrote one called uh, Les Miserables. No, it wasn't Les Miserables. It was uh, uh, Les Contemptible. That's what it was. Okay. And it was, they came to me and they said, hey, we want, we want to do a wraparound show. And I said, great. And they said, let's set it, uh, we want to set it in revolutionary France. And I went, uh, Hercules? in revolutionary France. You got to give me a little more here. What they said, yeah, we just want to do something where it's, you know, revolutionary France. And I said, okay. So I took, uh, I took, uh, um, uh, I can't remember what the, uh, dangerous liaisons. I took the, yeah. the movie dangerous liaisons great, and I basically, movie. I took that concept and married it to the scarlet pimpernel. <laughs> and I took that and I said, okay, so, uh, they had, uh, Salmonius, which was one of the kind of recurring characters in the show plays this, uh, Scarlet Pimpernel like uh, character. I think they called it, I called him the chartreuse fox. And he is with this beautiful woman and he's talking to her about how he can turn anybody into a hero. And then of course he runs into Iolas and Hercules who are just these kind of bumbling thieves and he kidnaps them and forces them to listen to the lessons from other shows of Hercules to become heroes. And that, that was kind of the concept of the piece. Uh, pretty wacky, uh, pretty out there. The other one that that was interesting uh, for a lot of reasons was uh, I did a, a show, an episode called A Star to Guide Them, which was a retelling of the birth of Christ. Just in terms of history, doesn't really make a lot of sense. since mm. if you think about the Greek mythology and gods, probably not at the same time that that Christ was being born, but but, the di but dinosaurs and humans were around the same time, so it doesn't matter. You know, you you have to you have to go with it a little bit. So that one uh, was actually written by the executive producer, and then he left the show, mm -hmm. and they called and asked me on a Thursday, would I come in and do a rewrite? And I said sure. They, I said, when do you need it? They said Monday. So of course, I took the yeah, of course. So I took that show and rewrote it and on uh, Thursday delivered on Monday, and that was an episode where Iolas um, is I, kind of I again I married Close Encounters of the of the Third Kind with uh, um, uh, with the birth of Christ, where he gets hit by a star and it suddenly, you know, he has <laughs> to follow this path to, to this manger where Christ is being born. So you're basically kind of like the, the originator of Sharknado. Like you threw two yes, things exactly. together and just like, well, sharks and tornadoes. Obviously, why wouldn't you do something? Of course, like who that? wouldn't who wouldn't think of these things? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Mash up. I'm all about it. So, but back in, you know when during the syndication days, because I remember watching a lot of those syndicated shows, mm -hmm. the, it was kind of carte blanche on a lot of these shows. Like you could do almost anything as long as the ratings stayed you are kind of free to do whatever you want. And I feel that there's within a reason bit, within reason, within reason, as yeah, long as you yeah. stayed within the rules of the world. And even then you could still break them a little yeah, bit. They, 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 they didn't mind breaking the rules of the world. They're actually, I, I worked on another show um, under a pseudonym, mm -hmm. which uh, called Acapulco heat. I remember Acapulco. Okay. Heat. <laughs> so Acapulco heat, I, I did two episodes on. And when they first pitched, this is, this is apropos to what you're talking about in mm -hmm. terms of they can do anything. Um, Acapulhit was pitched to me as an international spy thriller with a professional diving competition team. Okay. Yeah. It's going to go all over the world, have gadgets and do international spy stuff. And so cool. A diving James Bond. Got it. Yeah, exactly. Well, the first episode I wrote had to do with, uh, uh, an athletic event taking place in Israel and, and the Palestinians are trying to infiltrate and they think that one of the people in the shooting competition is actually going to end up being a, an assassin and all this stuff. Great. By the time we went into production, they said, okay, um, we couldn't find enough people that can dive. So they're, they're now swimsuit models. I said, okay, that's fine. Great. Swimsuit models. And that was fine. And we did that episode. And then they came back and said, we want you to do another, another episode. But, um, 
there are some budgetary constraints. I said, okay, what are those? They said, well, you can only have one guest star with two other speaking roles, and um, you can only have one other outside location besides our standing sets. So it went from this <laughs> huge international spy ring to you can have one location and three actors. And I was like, okay, basically I've got people on a beach saying, I will kill you. You can't kill me. I will kill you. <laughs> so that was about it. But, uh, so a lot of it had to do with what, what are the, you know, the, the monetary budgetary constraints. Um, Hercules was fun. They, they, I never heard them say, Oh, we can't do that. We can't afford that. Other shows sometimes, but particularly in, in, you know, yeah, they got to go, well, we can't really have, you know, a horde. How about two guys? <laughs> you know, and so. a dream. Two guys and a dream. Yeah. Yeah. No, Her yeah. Hercules was fairly popular and it spun mm -hmm. off to Xena and spun off mm -hmm. to Young Hercules and spun yep. off to a lot of yeah. things. So that there was, was a, there was there was actually also there was a, an animated series that yeah. was spun off. Yeah. In fact, the last time I went in to meet with them, they asked me to come in and pitch, and um, almost everything I, I said, they came back to me and said, "Oh, we did that on Xena. Can't do that." I said, "Okay, well, what about this?" They, "Oh, we did that on the on Young Hercules. Can't do that. What about this? We did that on the cartoon. <laughs> we did that in the features of the cartoon. We did that on the feet. It's like, okay, I give up." So wow. they they had they had a universe. They had a complete universe. Well, mm -hmm. now, so now you, you do a lot of teaching and you, and you mm -hmm. do a lot of instructing of young screenwriters. What are the biggest mistakes you see uh, young screenwriters make? You know, really coming right out of the box, the biggest thing that I see is that they want to do something that is uh, not – that is heartfelt, which is great, but not necessarily commercial. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that a lot of young filmmakers forget is that films have to be producible. And that means several different things. It means one, there has to be a commercial angle. That doesn't mean it has to be, you know, X-Men or the Marvel universe. But what it does mean is it, it has to have a place in the industry. So for instance, um, if you're going to do something that's very interpersonal and very kind of, you know, small, you have to expect that you're going to have a budget and uh, a contained enough that you can do it in a, on a very low budget that allows it to be, uh, done on a, on a small scale and in, you know, art houses or directed to video. If you can't do that, um, then you've got to be able to get to the stars. And generally, the writer right out of the box, they're not going to have that access. Right. So my, my advice is, you know, look for something that is absolutely personal and touches you, but find a way to couch it that is, uh, that attracts a wide audience. Um, because I think a lot of times, you know, you, you're, and it's, it's a hundred percent understandable. You write what you know, and when you're young, you know, you're, you're full of this kind of anticipatory, uh, anticipatory angst and, you know, where is the world going to go? And, and it tends to, a lot of young writers tend to do things that are very dramatic and very small and they're not really, you know, that's not really the popular, popular genre right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, unless you can make it for a budget that you can afford to do it exactly. yourself. If you can make it yeah, for 20, absolutely. if you make a feature for 20, 30,000, which is very, very doable in today's world. Yeah. I mean, right now there's, you know, unlike 20, 30 years ago, you know, you, you can take your iPhone, you can take your Samsung, you can go out and you can shoot a movie with that. You really can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's all kinds of gimbals and gadgetry that you can use. And there's, there's plenty of opportunity. If you have the will and you have the courage to just jump into the deep end, do it. But, you know, I, I work with a company right now called Horror Equity Fund, which is focused on the horror genre uh, and for a lot of different reasons. One is it's, it is a fairly low bar in terms of the entry into the industry and it's the highest return on investment uh, for narrative films. And, uh, you know, there's there's still, you know, we get a lot of stuff that's very, uh, it's not commercial. And, you know, that's kind it, of it may be that's terrific, but it's not commercial. That's actually quite surprising because you would think almost anything in the horror genre would be commercial, but apparently it's not. What, what's an example of a non-commercial horror idea? Because, I mean, well, generally horrors, like you got a ghost story, you have a slasher film, yeah. you've got a serial killer. There, there's multiple different genres, subgenres within that, but like what's yeah, not? No, it, really, it really has to do with the quality of the writing mm. when I talk about what, what is and isn't uh, commercially viable. Mm -hmm. And, I mean uh, – I'll give you an example. We had we had someone who came to us who um, 
whose kind of mantra was, I make really bad movies. Well, there, and, there is that subgenre. That, I mean, Lloyd, Co- Lloyd, Lloyd Kaufman has kind of cornered the mm-hmm. market on that without yeah. question, a trauma. Yeah. So, so the, those kind of things. But, but my feeling is, you know, yes, there's a place to aim for that. But the market has become so saturated in everything that you really have to have, do something that stands out. Um, I watched a movie the other the other day, part of a movie the other day, which was, uh, I think it was either Killer, I think it was Killer Donuts, Attack of the Killer Donuts. I, I, had, I had the producer on the show. Okay. So <laughs> I, 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 I apologize. I don't, don't. Through. It's okay. It's not supposed to be gotten <laughs> through. <laughs> I, yeah. Well, then it succeeded in exactly what it was. But I, I, I really marveled at the fact that one, people got it done. You know, they got an actor they, in it. They got to see Thomas Howell yeah, in it. Yeah, and and they and they got it into the theaters. You it's know? well, it was because I mean, the theaters, but I got it, I don't know if it went to theaters. Or it went, it did, I'm not sure if it went theatrically, but it did go international, and he did yeah. make money with it. A lot of it actually. Yeah. But the thing was that the don't the the poster mm-hmm. was so brilliant. That's why I got him on the show when I saw the poster. And I'm like, I have to, I have to. It's just like, you know, donuts with like teeth coming with out teeth. of a box yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's all dark. It's a like very 80s Careful. style. And there is a, definitely an audience for that kind of movie. And it, when, I saw, the, when and I saw the trailer, it was like, oh. So, so, I mean, the thing about that is, and, and we do look at this, is that, you know, that film had a hook. Very much so. Yeah. You know, you look at it and you go, oh, the poster, oh, I got to see it. I got to see a movie where donuts are attacking and killing people. You just know, what, because what it's. It? And then. Don't they don't they become giant donuts too? Isn't that? I, I I've, I've never personally seen the whole thing. So. I think they um, do. I think they become donuts. I mean, it's a little bit. You know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, there was an Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Well, of course, that's the start. That's the start of it. You know, the same kind of. It's in that same wheelhouse for sure. But the big difference was that back then there was no competition. There wasn't as much saturation. Of right. media and the well, film because you like didn't a, have people that said, "I've got a stupid idea. I'm going to go out and play." Although, yeah, you didn't have you didn't have the shark. And it was and it was it was and it was also shot on film back then. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Know? Yeah, and the expense of that has changed significantly. Now, so. would you? Do, I mean, I always tell people this too. Like, there are certain time periods and certain windows of opportunity where certain things will fly, certain mm-hmm. careers will flourish. Where in today's world they wouldn't, or in, in a different in a different uh, time it wouldn't. Yep. So. A Lloyd Kaufman in Troma mm-hmm. got was able to build their their foundation in the eighties and nineties during the DVD revolution, during the VHS revolution where you were renting start, like the blockbusters and the sure. mom and pop. That doesn't exist anymore. So if someone like Troma shows up today, it's a tough sell. It, it is. You know? the, the, the difference is, you know, where where it used to be direct to DVD, now you got the streaming services. And there's too much and yeah. It it is but it's changing. And right now, you know, you, you have, there are a lot of entities that are getting into the game that are going to have to have a ton of content and they're going to all be competing against each other. Mm -hmm. Um, Apple is getting in the game. You've got, you know, got already got Netflix and Hulu. Disney is now in the game. I mean, I'm already buying, Uh, I mean, Disney's already, did you hear what they're doing with frozen two? So uh, no. So frozen two will be the Uh first Disney movie that will go theatrical and then will only live on, on, Disney their, Plus. on their platform. It will yeah. not be available for rental. It will not right. be available for purchase. It will only live on Disney Plus. So how yeah, many subscribers will you think they're going to get off of that? Sure. And, it's genius. And, you know, it really it, genius. It's been, that's been the formula. You know, when, when Netflix uh, came out with Arrested Development, yeah. uh, you know, and rebooted that when they, when they had House of Cards, you know, they, there are things that the, the, streaming services are doing to and disney has an incredible library and at some point they can say <laughs> you know uh you want to watch a marvel movie you come to us you want to watch you know i mean they've got star pixar star wars yeah. uh what it, uh, pixar star wars marvel fox the entire exactly. fox and, and they bought lionsgate today what do you mean they bought lionsgate today they bought lionsgate disney bought lionsgate today yeah. i didn't even know I that that's right I, mean, I think no. so. double, you double check me on that. Yeah, double check. They yeah. bought Lionsgate. I think so. Holy let me, let me cow! Uh, I really I, thought it was going to be it. Apple. I thought it was Apple was going to buy Lionsgate because someone was going to buy them. We all yeah. knew. It. We all knew it. Well, I think it was. No, well, it's not on here. But um, we'll look it up. We'll it will be determined. Anyone listening, this will be in the future, so you'll easily yeah. know if it's true or not. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> 
that's my thought. Um, but, the, but yeah, so you can fact check me. It's okay. Sure. But the, the, you know, with that, all of those different you know studios, because they're going to have to have original and exclusive content. There's going to be a, for a while. There's going to be a huge boom in in acquisition. I don't know if they're going to go out and produce. The, you know, the thing about Netflix. Netflix is I'll produce producing a ton, but they're acquiring just as much as they're they're producing, and they're very. They have the pick of the litter right now, so they can go and they can get J.J. Abrams, or they can get you know Guillermo del Toro, or they can get you know Spielberg or whoever they want. They, although Spielberg, he's he's not he's a fan of Apple. Netflix. Let me take that back. He's he's, um, he's over at Apple. He's at Apple. Right? So you know, there's there's going to be this fight for who's going to have the greater talent and and the content that only can be seen there. HBO is another example where, you know, if you want to see Game of Thrones, man, you went to you went to HBO and HBO's changed their model a little bit. You know, they used to be um, the network of really high quality and they are seeing the landscape and going, that's not going to be enough. We have to have we have to have uh, quantity as well as qu- uh, quality. So they're yeah. they're changing. So. Yeah, it's it's funny because HBO could have, you know, they had they had the, the potential to own that space as well. Yeah. Um, let's not even talk about Blockbuster. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but but it's fascinating. And at the end of the day, the 800 pound gorilla is actually Apple. If, yeah. No Apple, question. Apple could buy Disney cash. Mm-hmm. Do, yeah. do you, do, do, like saying it out awesome. loud. It, it, no, it's 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 really awe-inspiring to think about the question is what are they going to do with it you know and they've they've started off with you Slow. know they're start, the right they're, talent, just but... like two like two billion they're, i think they're spending like two billion i think this year mm-hmm. it's like they're slow slow it's a slow burn for them right um which is they, what twice what i spent last year so i understand uh, obviously obviously me too yeah. um but but like someone like netflix is spending eight to ten billion mm-hmm. a year disney yeah. Disney can out. I don't know if Disney. Disney could definitely outspend Netflix, but they have the properties that everybody wants, and then sure. they also have the libraries that everybody wants. Uh, as yeah, well. that, that's uh, well, that's one of the things I'm wondering. You know, what's going to happen in terms of? Uh, you know, I, I presume that the deals at Netflix and Hulu, uh, and uh, you know, Disney owns Hulu. Pandora. Yeah. You know, they're, Disney they're, owns Hulu now. No, so no, they, they're of... the majority. When they bought Fox, they became the majority stockholder oh. in, in in Hulu. So, so Hulu will probably have continue to have some Disney content, but you know, I, I think eventually Netflix. Oh, no, it's gone. Gonna that, have, that, that deal's yeah. gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. The whole Marvel, all the Marvel shows on there got canceled because they're like, yeah. well, we don't want to do anymore because Disney is opening up their rival studio. I mean, I'll look. I'll be the first one in, online for Disney Plus because I have kids and I love yeah. Marvel and I'm, I love and I would love to just go to one place and just like I don't have to go hunting for a movie. I, sure. I know it's there. And they yeah. got Fox. And now you're saying they have Lionsgate as well, which is yeah. insane. They're, they're huge. And, you know, so they're, they're going to be, they're going to be formidable and Apple can absolutely be a player in that space, but it's going to be what happens with their content, what kind of content, you know, I, I just not, I digress, but you know, direct TV and AT&T, they're another huge entity, mm-hmm. but they're, I haven't seen the quality of the content come from them. But their you know? but their but their quality of work is is not good, and they're That's also and yeah. they're also in legacy technology, mm-hmm. cable. Cable right. is legacy technology. Dish is cable is legacy technology. Right. It is not right. the future of where things will go. So right. they're just struggling to, to keep a foothold on things. Yeah. Um, but it's it, it, but that's a whole another space that you know could have should have and didn't. And if Apple doesn't doesn't you know, rise the level of a Hulu, of an HBO, of a Disney, they're not going to have the audience. Netflix will just, I mean, they'll just buy Netflix. They'll just buy Netflix straight up. I think, I think that's probably yeah. the acquisition that everyone's counting on that Apple is just oh, going to really? buy Netflix. I've heard that right. from multiple in- industry insiders. They're like, you know, Apple could easily just go in and buy Netflix. Well, they can. Well, it, yeah, well, they can go sure. and buy, I mean, they literally, they have 200 and what is it? 250 or 270 billion cash. Cash mm-hmm. sitting in the bank. Cash. Yeah, pretty good. It's not. I mean, <laughs> double what Just I have. Just the interest on that's pretty good, right? Double, yeah. double what I have at least. You can um, live off the interest, right? I can live off the interest off of a, a percent of that, sir. But, um, but with all that said, with screenwriting though, that there the potential and the opportunity for screenwriters now is just massive. Mm-hmm. So many writing, so many shows, so many good shows mm-hmm. out there. Mm-hmm. You know, I, every there's and not a day goes by where friends like, oh, did you watch that show on? X network. I'm like, right. 
Nah, man, I haven't. Who has oh, time? How many hours in the day? I mean, there, right? there's like, I was just second this to another guest the other, the other day. I was like, look, you know, I would need multiple lifetimes mm -hmm. to watch all the good shows on, on, on TV right now, where yeah. when I was coming up and growing up, when I was working in my video store in the late 80s, early 90s, I literally watched everything that got released every week, which sure. was five or six movies, right? right? And TV, cable, there was like, you know, I have 30 shows. Like that yeah. was it total, you know, sure. now there's uh, how many shows are there? there's like got 2000 shows a month, a year. Yeah. And there's it's, so it's, many uh, shows. So there's a lot of opportunity for, for screenwriters, but there's also a lot of competition. Yeah. It's easy to get lost. It just for the reason you're, you're talking about. And one of the things that, you know, when I talk to students, I talk to, I consult with writers, it's, it's really about how do you find a voice that is going to attract attention? How do you find a voice that's unique to you? Mm -hmm and and has a quality to the work that's undeniable right exactly. and those are the things that you have to really focus on when you're when you're starting in the craft now is the is, creative is the creative process for you different when you're working in tv rather than in film um th there are different pressures when you're in tv <laughs> you know you ha you have you have a, a time crunch that you don't have as a feature writer unless you're hired to write you know a film for a studio, and even then, there's flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, with television, you know, uh, particularly if you're writing sitcoms, it's you know, you, you write, you, you got a script to write. It's got a, it's due. It's like the one you know on Hercules. Thursday, okay, Thursday we need it Monday. Monday. And then you, it's not that fast, but but they, you know, you have to be able to perform under pressure, and you have to be able to get the scripts out quickly in television. That's important. Um, but ultimately, you know, and even now, it's more about quality how good is it you know how much right. how much do people want to see that episode how much do people want to you know what did you bring to the table in terms of the character voices in terms of you know an, uh, a kind of a a new take on on what we've been doing and particularly in television you know when i was coming up you wrote a spec script of a of a show right and and then you didn't give that to the show that you wrote because they wouldn't look at it. You gave it to somebody else and they looked at it and went, oh, this is great. And you got a gig, a gig off of that. Now, most shows are not really interested in looking at specs as much as pilots. And certainly the, the representation out there, much more interested in seeing somebody with original work. The problem with that from a showrunner's perspective is if you write a, an original piece of material and I'm looking at you as a staff writer on my show is can you really capture the purview and the characters and the voices and, you know, get the essence of my show. You can do your thing. Great. But can you do mine? And that's where the idea of having a spec uh, sample is a, also a great idea. And I, I always recommend that if you're going to do that, have a pilot and have a spec, you know, find a show that you love, do a spec episode. Now, there's so much more, I feel, uh, freedom in TV now. Uh, and I use the term TV very loosely because it's streaming, it's web, it's whatever. Sure. Um, but episodic, if you will. Mm -hmm. There is so much more freedom, I feel, there because th that I feel is where all the in a lot of the, the independent filmmakers and a lot of uh, those kind of people that would have normally found a voice in the indie world mm -hmm. have found a stable job in the streaming world. And it's also sure. there's it's kind of. I, I won't say it's the wild, wild west, but there is things that like Breaking Bad or mm -hmm. um, Better Call Saul for those from that that universe. Those shows are like you would have never in a million years had a show like that right. 20 years ago. It just wouldn't have yeah. never happened. It would have just never happened. And there's shows like that all the time coming out now. And there's mm -hmm. and they're everywhere and they're all mm -hmm. good. And yeah. I feel like the quality of everything has to go up now because the audience is so much smarter, but now there's so much more competition that it's not about the, the flashy. It's not, that's why the, 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 the era of the movie star mm -hmm. is, is kind of gone. Like, you know, just because you have Tom Cruise in a movie does not guarantee an opening like it no. used to. Like, I mean, no, you put Will I, Smith, you put Will Smith in a movie. It was 20 million minimum opening every right, time. Right. Those days are gone. Like really who there are, there's a handful of them. There's a handful of guys or girls that if you put in, help but by yeah. no stream guarantees it's it's all now about the event yeah, yeah. and you know in in a way you know a similar thing happened on broadway and you know thanks partly to disney um Lion but King. again you know the shows went from 
you know, small musicals to we have to do, you know, Spider-Man turn on the lights. We have to do King Kong. We have to do, you know, really. And and the film industry is is kind of a microcosm of the world as well. And so you have the Marvel Universe. You have, you know, uh, the Star Wars, Star Wars Universe. Pixar, you yeah. have, yeah, the Pixar, it's all Disney. But you have those universes which people will still go to the theater because it's an event movie. If you're going to go, it's going to be a spectacular, you know, big screen event. You want to see it with an audience. But there are shows like um, I, I watch uh, uh, A Handmaid's Tale. Oh, so who, good. Brutal. Really, brutal really, really beautifully made, right? Brutal. Beautifully brutal made. Show. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, terrifically acted, oh. very well written, gorgeously shot. Um, they have a lot of talented people. Game of Thrones on HBO. You know, you have that was an epic, epic series. I could you could make the argument that had they done that as a feature series, that it probably would have garnered an audience. And it might have because it was epic, but not every episode was epic. So, you know, it had its own journey on television. The thing that's happening in in terms of what what's available for the industry, in terms of what's available for the for the young writer, the new writer it's democratized it in some ways, but it, you're right. It's also the level has been raised so much that it makes it very difficult for a young writer to break in on, on a higher level. So part of what writers need to do, in my opinion now, is anything. <laughs> you need to do short content. You need to do web content. You need to do and also produce short, And produce your own stuff if you can produce if it. If you can afford to do it. Produce or or team up with someone sure. who can produce yeah. a series. I always tell I always tell screenwriters, uh, you know, like write a web series or write a mm -hmm. streaming series. Write four or five episodes at ten minutes each, yeah. and and join a filmmaker who has the means. They're looking for content. You're looking for production, and all right. of a sudden on your IMDb you have a a credit that states that you have an Amazon series. Yeah, it's I better mean, than it, nothing. It's not a bad idea. It's you know there's it's the uh, where's that guy who said he would team up with me? You know, how do you find those people? That's well, we're the, we're, that's we're in LA. We're, we're in yes. LA. So they're, they're, it's easier. It's easier here. But no, but you're right. Yeah. You're right. It depends on where you are in the world. But it is. I You know, I shot a film in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. in uh, Appleton, Wisconsin. And we ran out of we ran out of, out of gaffer's tape. And I, I, I ran over to every hardware store no. you know in the city and couldn't no. find and people looked at me like I was at this huge box store and you know they were looking at me like gaffer's tape <laughs> they had no clue and I, I went well that looks kind of like gaffer's tape and I brought stuff up but you know you a lot of it is what 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 is available around you that doesn't mean that you can't get stuff done um uh, uh, an, an acquaintance of mine who I've uh, had come and speak to my classes a few times is Oren Paley who did um, uh, paranormal activity. Yes, yes, He's the yes, director, yes. writer, producer, editor on that. And it, you know, it was really a fascinating study on someone just going, "Well, I can do that." And yeah. he took 15k out of his own pocket. But what he did that others who do the same path had, didn't do, he worked for a year and a half on just, you know, kind of conceptualizing how are the shots going to work. You know, what am I going to do? How do I make this effect happen? What? How do I make the door close on its own? You, what, you mean he did his it? homework? You actually, he actually he did his homework beautifully. And the other thing he did that I thought was really sharp is he got terrific actors and he worked with them, uh, improvised with them for a long time before they got before the cameras. It was a five day shoot when they actually sat down to shoot it. And they basically slept at his house and, you know, he'd come in and scare the crap out of him in the middle of the night. And then he went, you know, I probably don't have to do that. <laughs> About halfway through, he went, yeah, I probably shouldn't shouldn't wake them up at three in the morning with, you know, scary noises. And stuff. So he, he <laughs> kind of learned on the job. It's like bit. method, method but, directing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, they, you know, those kind of things absolutely can be done. But, you know, what people kind of universally make a mistake, particularly outside of the industry, is they think, well, if you can make a movie for $15,000, you can make any movie for $15,000. No. It's so not true. No. You know, movies cost what they cost. And, and you know, it's fine to do it as kind of like, I've got to get something done and I want to make something and go out and just do it. And you bite and you scratch and you claw. But as a business model, not a good idea to do everything for $15,000 on a feature level. Nobody gets paid. You know, the food's crap. Nobody sleeps. Not You know, and you end up, Nine times out of ten, you end up with crap. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one out of 
a thousand you get paranormal activity. The rest are like, you know, oh, they're no, going to sit no, on no. someone's shelf. No, more than one, one 10, out of a million. A million? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How many, how many other films can you count in the last 30 years that were made for 15 grand and bold in $300 million? Uh, oh, none. No, none. Yeah, even Blair no. Witch didn't do that. Yeah, Blair Witch was uh, 60,000. I think uh, no, no, it was, it was like 27, 35,000, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then it made uh, 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 just a, uh, a small for, 180 you million. You figure in inflation. Inflation you're looking at. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's a lot of money. I had Eduardo on the show and he, the, his sto the story of the Blair Witch from their perspective is yeah. fascinating. It was a fantastic. Yeah, sure. And I'd love to get uh, Paley on the, on the show as well because he's, his story is just different. It's just the I next think he generation. Moved to New Zealand. Yeah, he's he's out. Oh yeah, he's he's good. gone. He, he's you know, I, one of the things he said, he, you know, I, I his journey was he was a he was a programmer with a, a video game company mm -hmm. and hated it, mm -hmm. and saw Blair Witch and went, I can do something like that. Came up with this idea. He says, you know, and he said, I hit the I hit the, the lottery. I hit the jackpot. He said, I don't have to do anything else. Ever. Ever. And he wasn't really all that interested in being a filmmaker as much as it was this was I, I think I can do this. And then, you know, he directed a few other things. He produced a few other things. He had that universe that went on, you know, and continues to go on. And he kind of went, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> so, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, he did fine. So when you're when you're going when you're doing writing uh, when you're doing writing listen to me yes when I'm doing writing when you're doing writing uh, uh -huh. when you write uh, how do you approach structure because I think that's something that a lot of a lot of screenwriters and writers in general have problems with structure is yeah, a, is the, a roughness. the two the two things that are probably uh, for me the most important in writing are structure and and logic story okay. logic okay the idea that I create a world and a universe that makes sense that doesn't mean that it's a, a real universe or a real world it could be as fanciful as you can imagine um but you want to be able to track the motivation of the characters and understand why they behave the way they behave and that's one of the things that for me structure and character are are really intimately tied together because it is what the character does the behavior that they have that makes the choices for the story in other words, you know, uh, the, the example I, I use in my book, I think, is that, you know, you have you, it, one of the first films that uh, Sylvester Stallone did was a Woody Allen movie mm -hmm. where was he's a, a mugger. A, yeah, and the, yeah, on the train. It was called Bananas. Yeah. And he's a mugger on a train. And if you switch those parts and you put Sylvester Stallone seated in on the bench and, you know, somebody like Woody Allen coming in and messing with people, how does it change that? Well, obviously... Those characters make very different choices. So every individual person, their lives unfold a certain way. Um, there was a movie uh, with uh, Diane Lane and, um, oh gosh, uh, Unfaithful. Oh, yeah. You, that you yeah. Were, yeah. And, you know, you, there was a character um, that was played by Richard Gere as this kind of devoted husband who's being betrayed. And throughout the film, he's very sympathetic. And I, I'm going to do a spoiler. I apologize to anybody who hasn't Please, seen the film. It's, it's too many years. But it's okay. Yeah, it's been long enough. I think, I think the pain is gone. So at the end of the film, he confronts his wife's lover and in a moment of passion picks up a, a globe, uh, you know, a, a snow, snow globe, globe and, yeah, and smashes him in the head and kills him completely out of character. And you believe it and understand it 100%. Nobody walks out of the movie going, well, he would not do that. You know, not really. So that's what I mean by okay. you know, understanding Logic. the motivation of the characters. That, that that becomes a pivotal moment of the story because then it becomes, here is this good, decent guy. Now what's he going to do? And he ends up, of course, going and uh, you see him outside the police station getting ready to turn himself in. So one of the things that I look at is that kind of clarity in who the people are so i to to understand structure i really have to understand one the world of the character where are they what kind of universe are they in and then the other is that character who who are they at their core what are their values you know uh, sometimes i get like these little flashes of of uh uh you know gameplay where you know you have to decide their stats you know mm -hmm. how much intelligence and how much you know how much power and how much uh you know speed and all the different things that make up who they who they are because that's going to determine 
the choices that they make. It is. It's. It's about. Um, it's kind of like Captain America turns into Tony Stark all of a sudden. He starts being the crack, right. doing the crack, right. uh, the wise cracks, and and starts being that character. I'm like, yeah. well, that doesn't make a lot of logical sense in that world. You have to stay within the rules that you've created for yeah. this universe. And I'll, you I'll might. Give you, I'll give you yeah, a slightly, ahead. slightly better example. Okay. If you saw um, Superman versus Batman. Oh, okay. Don't get me started. So. <laughs> And we have a moment where these two, you know, superheroes are going at each other and Batman is ready to kill Superman. And he's got him mm -hmm. pinned down mm -hmm. with a kryptonite spear that yeah. will kill him. Mm -hmm. And out of something, Superman says, Martha. The and stupidest. Batman says, why did you say Martha? And he says, well, that's my mother's name. He says, ah. That's, That's, your mother's my name. That's my mother's, mother's name. name. Hey, oh. Goomba, let's go. So it is the stupidest. To me, that that oh. was a moment of character logic that that just completely destroyed that film for me. Not that the not that I was really? with it before Re that. Was that what I was going to say? Was that the moment that it, you no, got lost? But no. <laughs> that was, but that was the one that was most glaring for me because I went here are these two guys that are killing each other, and the idea that that the guy who he who has in in Batman's eyes murdered half of Metropolis. Um, you know, shouldn't shouldn't be destroyed just, because they have a mother. And and the next step here, we have a universe where Superman is one of the most powerful beings. Batman has almost killed him. He's lying on the floor, and Batman says to him, and I'm I'm paraphrasing here. Um, hey, I know you're probably the most powerful being in the world, but you know you've been through a lot right now. Just rest. I know your mother's about to be murdered, but I'll go. I'll go gas up my bat jet. I'm sure it's already to take off. I'll go save her. Yes, you know, shooting through the window, I might hit her, but I'll try not to. I'm going to rescue her and bring her back. You just hang out. Don't worry about the flying thing. Do your thing. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? That's Superman. He jumps up. He go gets his mother. What, why are you getting his mother in this plane where you're going to shoot Machine gun uh, fire. Th it just was insane. I, I just, I love that, that you're trying to create some logic of one of the worst films in recent uh, history. No, no. I mean, that's I'm, like. I'm not, I'm not I know. I know. I know. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. like, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course there's no logic in it. And let's not even get but, it to Justice that's, League. That's a whole and, other conversation. But that film suffered for that. You know, yeah. and you look at that DC versus the Marvel universe. Oh, it's, yeah. You know, Marvel tends to have within the world very logical, very well thought out structure. And that structure has to do, you know, the other thing about structure that people talk about, um, and it's changed over the years a little bit, it used to be that you could have a slow burn, you could have a story that kind of rolls out. And now you, you really need to hook the audience immediately. You've got to get into the story quickly. You've got to build the suspense or the comedy or the drama or whatever you're building and get to the heart of the story. So what what becomes a little more difficult now is filling the story with with what is compelling to an audience. And that becomes really the bottom line. I mean, you could argue as well that, I mean, the second that they made Superman brooding, um, who's not, which is not his character. His character is not a brooding, pissed off, angry character. He's a very uplifting, very much like Wonder Woman. I think what's mm -hmm. what made Wonder Woman so wonderful is that it was so full of hope and so full of, you know, just goodness. Empowerment empowerment and, yeah and and that goes back to earlier superman movies in this universe i mean it wasn't just here oh yes man of steel yeah, the man of steel too like he killed he killed zod like he, superman doesn't kill you yeah, can, right. he just doesn't kill you know like you don't do that in this right. you know then you go back to christopher reeve superman and you're like that's the superman that is in the books that's the superman yeah. That's, yeah, that's the source yeah material. In the you comic know? books, he was the... And, but that's the one thing that Marvel does have, many things, one of the many things that Marvel has over is they're really true to the source material. Yeah. They and, know... And they have writers that are, you know, just their, their sharpest tacks. They have great I mean, writers. they made Ant-Man the movie. Ant-Man the <laughs> movie. And it was fun. And mm -hmm. it was fun. It was a heist movie. It was fun. Yeah. They made Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm a comic book guy. I barely knew who they were. Right. They could do whatever they want. Basically, whatever. I think at this point, they're drunk on their power and watch the downfall of Marvel Universe moving forward yeah, in the maybe, next five or ten you know, years. Again, it's going to be, can, you know, this is a hard, honest to God, you know, keeping that kind of level of quality up 
It is not easy. But they did it and they've done films. it over a, a large number of films for a long time. And finding the talent that can continue to bring out that kind of level of quality, it's hard. And, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot for a, a rabid fan base to turn on you. You know, yeah. it does. You know, if you look at look at Star Wars and Ooh, look at, you know, Jar, Bar, Jar Jar Binks, you know, and, and oh, oh, yeah. Solo. You know, how, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. They'll they'll they'll, they'll turn quick. But God, but the, the difference between that is Marvel. The Marvel Universe is full of comic book geeks and Marvel's been dealing with comic book fans for <laughs> Decades, yeah. so yeah. they're they're very comfortable with with uh, the heat. With who, who, who their audience is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, can you give us some? Well, I want to ask you: Is there a film that you can recommend that has impeccable structure? Like when you see it, well, you're just like, "Wow!" You know, uh, the, I can think of a, a quite a few examples, and it really kind of kind of has to do with what kind of story do you want to tell? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a big believer in kind of. Like you're, you're a real estate developer, you look at the comps, you look at what's out there, you look at, you know, what kind of movies do you love that you want to write? Um, you know, I do a, uh, and I've always thought it was one of the really, truly brilliantly structured movies, was Shrek. Oh, it is. I, it's, it's, it's by I break the down numbers. In my, I oh. break it down in, in my book, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of beat by beat. And, you know, it has everything that you want in terms of a story, in terms of the structure. It starts with this hook that gets you immediately into the story and tells you exactly what universe we're in. What, what is the world we're about to experience? You know, it starts out with him in a crapper, you know, with this fairy tale, very lilting story. And then he says, yeah, right. And wipes his ass with the book. And we go, OK, I, I get it. It's going to be irreverent. It's going to be funny. It's going to be, you know, unusual. Then it goes into this kind of montage of him and the people who are getting ready to try and throw him out of his swamp and. You know, he's taking wax out of his ears and that, you know, that kind of completely described in a nutshell, the universe that we were in. And it just goes from there. And every beat is meticulous in terms of what happens structurally, where it goes from there. So that was one I loved. I, I thought on kind of a comedy drama side, I thought uh, Silver Linings Playbook was oh, very well structured. Beautiful movie. And, and again, you know, really well structured. We. You know, we meet our kind of reluctant hero who, you know, is pining for the girl of his, uh, in his past that he wants to get back and has to put together this plan to try and win her and meets Jennifer Lawrence. I mean, it's all, again, all there. And we get, you know, it's a, it's a very, you know, way different story from uh, from Shrek in terms of, you know, oh, of how it's structured, where it goes, flows out because of different genres. Um I was mentioning I, I went to China in January uh, to be a part of the, the first national Chinese screenwriting competition. Mm -hmm. It was one of the uh, mentors. And one of the things that I did is they they wanted to publish my book there. And I and they asked if I would look at some of the Chinese films. And one of the films I looked at was a film called The Mermaid. Yeah, I remember you know that. Movie. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So The Mermaid was the highest grossing film in China history at the time made over $500 million worldwide and ba barely made a splash here. And I started to look at it in terms of not just structure, but why, why didn't it work? It's from Stephen Chow, who I love. Yeah, Stephen was, Chow she's did great. Kung Fu Hustle and, and great, Shaolin great and Soccer. Yeah, great, great. wonderful. And, and imaginative and fun and inventive. And um, I, I thought, uh, you know, in terms of structure, I thought uh, Kung Fu Hustle was wonderful. Um, not, it's not typical to the American sensibility in terms of structure. And in this film, again, he went into fantasy, comedy, but there were two things that I thought stopped it from being successful here. And one was uh, there, there is a tone shift in the film where it's an extremely wacky comedy, you know, with this mermaid walking on her fins, you know, and seducing this guy. And, but then there are moments where we see uh, dolphins and Taiji being slaughtered and, you know, uh, the mermaids being killed by sound waves and slaughtered by people shooting them. And it's, yeah. it's it just, yeah. you know, the, the, it, there was a mismatch in terms of the tone. And the other thing was the logic, the story and character logic, where it was a little bit about, we have to set up this, this, 
big, you know, overriding um, enemy for them to be, for our heroine to be fighting against. And therefore, it doesn't really matter. It's more a MacGuffin than anything else. But the MacGuffins in the world still have to come out of something. Mm -hmm. And they still have to be able to come out. Because otherwise, what happens is an audience member, and I, I always try to put myself in, you know, in the seat of the audience. I think as an audience member, when we see something that we just, even if we don't you know, clock it consciously, unconsciously, we sit there and go, that doesn't quite feel true to me. That doesn't work. And it just takes us out of the film a little bit. So we, we distance ourselves from the emotional impact of the movie. And that's, I think, what happened with this film, even though, even though ultimately it's a fun ride. It's a, it's a wonderful ride. But there just are these moments where you just go, wow, what, 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 what happened to the world I was in? So the consistency of the character, the consistency of the, of the story logic, the world logic, and that tonal shift is what I think kept it from being a hit here. It doesn't mean that, and, and I don't know enough about Europe and the rest of the world to say, well, you know, they, they accept that, that's fine. And, you know, I, uh, do you know the movie The Lobster? Yeah, yeah okay. of course. Yeah, call, call now, a, lot of people, a lot of people love The Lobster. Yeah. Personally, not a fan. Okay. And for the same reason about this idea of story logic, uh, European films often will take a story and they'll go, they'll do two things. One is they'll say, eh, it's not really important why. We're just going to show you what. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that you get to a point where in that movie, for me, where where I kind of, you know, clinched on it, uh, besides it just being an odd film. And I like odd films. I love being John Malkovich. But, yeah. you know, the, what was odd about it was kind of fun, but it was also very dark. And what ultimately kind of, you know, made me go, eh, didn't work for me was we have a moment. I'm going to spoil it again. We have a moment where uh, in this world, every, everybody has to have a mate and every mate has to have um, something in common. And at the end, this young girl that he's in love with, uh, Colin Farrell, she's bl been blinded. And he's asking her, what's your favorite color? And she says, blue. And he says, oh, darn, you know, it's red. Anymore. Do you speak German? No, I don't speak German. Oh, darn it. And they have this moment where they're going back and forth about what, you know, what are you... What do we have in common? And the last shot of the film is him with needles poised to poke his eyes out. And I wanted to say to the film writer, have you ever laughed at a joke? Do you have two legs? How about hair? Do you, do you breathe? There are other things that they could have in common. Right. And I just, for me, it was logic. like, he's going to blind system. himself over this? And then they end it there. So we don't know if he blinds himself or not, which is very European. Very, um, very European. There's yeah, a, the, the, the movie The Skin I'm In. Do you know that one? No, no. I don't uh, know that it's, one. Uh, Antonio Banderas, and it's a uh, oh, Spanish yeah, film yeah, yeah, about yeah, the guy, yeah. the, the surgeon who takes the guy who rapes his daughter and, or attacks his daughter, doesn't actually rape her, attacks his daughter and, and forces them to have a sex change operation and then falls in love with her. Oh, yeah, that's, that's very mainstream. It's very mainstream. Yeah. That concept and, is very mainstream. And that, that film, really well done. But it had an ending where you went, really? This is where you – okay. All right. You know, well, and that's like, your opinion. That was like the – you know, I'm a huge fan of Tarantino's work. And mm -hmm. uh, one of his films that he wrote has this tonal shift that mm -hmm. is one of, the, one of the reasons why the movie I felt – I enjoyed because it was fun. But full, um, from Dust Till Dawn, mm -hmm. which half the movie is a wonderful kind of – caper not caper film but like a heist you know on the right. run kind of film with a psychotic you know sex driven you know pedophile which right. is played by tarantino and george clooney who's awesome and then right. all of a sudden it turns into this bloody vampire movie like out of nowhere like there's there's just yeah. not even a, a mention of a vampire anywhere before yeah and i mean it has gone on to spawn tv shows and a huge cult following but Everybody says it, and every, even to Tarantino and Rodriguez, who re directed it, is um, they both said too, like, well, everyone says it's two movies. I'm like, it is. Yeah, and here's the thing, you know, it's interesting because, you know, you have two master filmmakers yeah. there, and you know, n nothing wrong with what they did, but what happens, in my opinion, is, you know, because people always always talk to me about, well, you know. Don't you want to just break free from the structure? Don't you want to do something different? Don't you? And it's 100%. But the difference is that you have 
a wide uh, kind of, you know, V-shaped audience when you're in the structure zone. And as you change structure and you change character logic, you can still have an audience, but it starts to shrink. When you have masters like um, Tarantino and Rodriguez, you know, even though they they brought that in, they still had an audience. You know, you look at their their death proof. Mm -hmm. you know, the same kind of idea where, you know, no tonal shift, but it was it was made to be kind of an homage to oh, it's a know, very small. Movies. It was and, very. Yeah, it's a very it's a very kind of targeted. This is who we're going to go after. This is, and you know, you can hit a home run with that. But you know, uh, they uh, didn't. Who is it, Jim? Jim? No, but. But you can. Uh, who is it here? Jim Jarmusch, I think, is uh, the filmmaker. Jim Jarmusch. Who, yeah. Uh -huh. He he. You know he makes films that are, they're art house films. He gets his friends to do it. You know. Small budgets though. Yeah. He's got small budgets and but he's he gets got a, a lot of. But big... he's got a formula. You know he knows how to do that, mm -hmm. and he knows how to get it to where people want to see that. Well, it's like Woody Allen films back before Woody was you know did what he did, but um, but Woody films. I mean, to the, to to that point, he was making mm -hmm. a film a year for what thirty years, yeah. and he had a formula. He had yeah. a wonderful formula, and I was a fan of his. You know, as a director, I'm a fan of his work. You know, from Annie mm -hmm. Hall and, and and Crimes and Misdemeanors, Bullet sure. Over Broad. I mean, there's so many. Uh, Played that, stickball with him once. Did you now? That must have been yeah. fun. Okay. <laughs> But but, to, but it was but the point was that he was able to do small budgets, mm -hmm. huge movie stars that would mm -hmm. come on board for scale. It was a yep. filmmaker's dream, basically, yeah. and he had complete yeah. control. So, and you know, often his films didn't make money. No, and studios would do do a Woody Allen film because there was prestige to having a Woody Allen film. And now you go back, you know, to take the money and run, or you know, go back to uh, What's Up, Tiger Lily, or you know, some yeah. of his earlier movies, that was not the formula at that time. You know, he wasn't getting the big stars. He was just, he was just making his films. And, you know, I think uh, in Stardust, was it Stardust Memories? Yeah. That he did the, the kind of, uh, the aliens come down and talk to him about, you know, why don't you do more like your early films, the funny films? You know, it's like, and, uh, <laughs> and he has this kind of existential conversation with these aliens about, you know, artistic growth it's just, he's you know he's got a mind that just doesn't stop and he's great on that level on that on that on, on that level absolutely on that level. so i'm going to ask you a few questions i ask all of my guests sure. uh, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today uh don't say no um keep writing uh write as much and as varied and as often as you can and uh create things for yourself, if you can go out and shoot stuff, shoot stuff. Um, also, don't stop learning. Oh, don't stop so start taking classes. Don't stop uh, getting into network groups. Don't stop, uh, you know, trying to learn what's out there now. And be aware that this is, you know, as much as we all want to be artists, and and I do believe we are. You also have a business to take care of if you want to have that as a career. Uh, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Um, you know, I, I, I might, as a as a writer, I might actually have to go back to Sid Field's uh, screenplay. Yeah, that was, a, and, that was my first book too. You know, yeah, I mean, the, the thing about that, that was the first book that really kind of laid out structure for me. And and one of the things that, that um, you know, I started, it took me a while to come to the understanding of is that Sid Field kind of reversed engineered film. So you'd look at a film and say, oh, about you know, a third of the way through, there was this happens and then for, you know, this happens and then, and that that's formula and formula can be dangerous. So you have to, you have to take all of that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, you know, every 10 or 15 years, there's some kind of, seismic shift in the way that, that people read. The other, the other was for me was, um, a hero of the thousand faces, sure. Joseph Campbell. And, you know, when I first started out and I would go to meetings, people would say, Hey, you know, so what's a three act structure? You know, what happens on page 29? You know, what happens on page 30? And then people were saying, well, what's the hero's journey? And, you know, and, and who's your wizened old man and what boon is he bringing back? And then, you know, eventually, um, more recently, uh, it was uh, Blake Snyder. Safe the cat. Yeah, it was right in my mind. Yeah. And honestly, 
I have I had negative reaction to uh, save the cat for the reason that I felt like it micro uh, micromanaged, you know, something on five page five page seven page nine, page, and but there were some nice things about it. Mm -hmm. The one thing about save the cat that you know they talk about in terms of pitching is the idea of what's well, the same as but different from, and for me that there's a real risk and danger of being derivative. And I look at films like uh, the the feature version of Hannah um, with Saoirse Ronan. Mm -hmm. where, very, you know, very, I love the movie. Yeah, but but what that movie was was the born identity with a little girl, you know, and I could just right. see the pitch, you know. It was like here's, so there, and, and um, you know who Tony Bill is? The producer name sounds the the, thing? the director. He was a, a director producer. Yeah, he, he directed did Untamed, uh, My Bodyguard. Untamed and, Heart. He did Untamed Heart. I think was another one with Christian um, with Christian Slater that? and Marissa Tomei. Maybe. Yeah, he, yeah, he but, did, yeah, but he, yeah. Um, he came and spoke to my class, and, and it was interesting because he was the polar opposite. He said, I don't want to see anything that anybody's ever done before. And as much as I admired that in a producer, I also thought, well, good luck. There's only so much in the world and the universe that people haven't seen. And, you know, you you just like there is a an audience that has a certain girth, um, you know, when you start to say, I'm going to show you something that no one's ever seen, you may hit that home run because you're aiming, you know, for those those corners. You may be foul. So, you know, use a baseball analogy. Obviously, um, obviously. <laughs> so that, you know, to me, that that was one of the risks in doing the Blake Snyder idea of, you know, same as but different from. Okay. But but for a while, when you went into pitch, that's the first thing. Well, how is it? The, how is what is it the same as and different? How is it different? Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know. That's how you learn it. So you want to know what the trends are. You want to know what how to be current. Um, for me, like I said, Hero a Thousand. Also, uh, uh, Bird by Bird, I enjoyed mm -hmm. very much. And and uh, I also really, really admire and liked uh, Stephen King's book on writing. Yeah, it's a great book. Great, great, great book. He had one of my favorite quotes of all, which was, that, you know, as a writer, I create an image here and I project it into the future. And in the future, someone receives it as I wrote it. And I went, wow, that's right. Because, you know, the clearer the image is that that person down the road is going to get it as you intended it, then it's well written. Very cool. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Wow. Um, we're probably still learning it, first of all. Um, you know, uh, the, yeah, one of the, probably the hardest lesson is to, to listen to criticism. Mm -hmm. And sure. Uh, you know, I, I think that sometimes, uh, you know, hearing from people that they don't just adore and love your work and, and that there are things that can be improved is difficult. And I think what the other thing about that is that you have to, you have to eventually learn to have a certain kind of core, uh, piece and center to say that that note is correct and I need to change it or that note isn't right. And I'm not going to change it and, and know when, you know, it's kind of a God grant me the serenity, you know, to know what the difference is. Okay. And that's a hard lesson to learn. What is the, what did you learn from your biggest failure? From my biggest failure? Uh, well, first of all, let me think, what was my biggest failure? Um, you know, what actually it goes back to this idea of notes. And one of the, I was a writer uh, for a TV movie for Universal and it was for Angela Lyonsbury. Mm -hmm. And I was, at the time, kind of sitting on top of the world. I was represented by William Morris. They had picked my script out of about 2,000 submissions to, to be the one that they wanted to write the script. And I wrote the script, and everybody was thrilled. And we missed her hiatus from Murder, She Wrote. And they had a little extra time to think about it. And they asked me to rewrite it. I ended up doing about 30... 30 drafts of the script um, without being paid for it. Ooh. And part of what happened was, um, and this is going a little bit to what's going on with the agents right now, the agency represented Corey Moore, the production company, and they were packaging for Corey Moore, and I was a writer. So they never, I was very young and very stupid, and nobody said to me, hey, you know, every time you write, you're supposed to be paid for it. And one of, but one of the things that happened is I got notes from Universal, from the producer at Universal, from the executives at Universal, from CBS, from Corey Moore, 
from Judith Christ of the New Yorker. Everybody and their cousin was giving me notes and I was trying to do them all. You can't do that. That was the lesson that, that I, that I really had to take in and go, okay, that failure taught me that I can't listen to everybody. I have to, I have to, I have to hear everybody, but I have to then follow what I think is the best course of action for the project. What makes it a better story? What makes it better character? What makes it more entertaining? Those are the things that are important. People don't always have the answer. They may have a question and you have to look at why did you ask me that? What is it I can do to address that without blowing up my concept and my idea and giving away my heart and soul on a project? What is the biggest fear you had to overcome to write your first screenplay? Ah, uh, my biggest fear. Um, you know, on my first screenplay, I was pretty fearless. So, so on you know, your second screenplay then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go with the second. Um, a lack of knowledge. Okay. Uh, the, the idea that I didn't know what I was doing. And it was really the, the real, it was more a realization than a fear mm -hmm. in that I wasn't afraid that I didn't know what I was doing. I discovered that I didn't know what I was doing. And I went, ah, okay. Do I, and then, and then the question is, you know, I, I had intended to be an actor. That's what I wanted. I didn't want to be a writer. I want to be an actor. So I was like, do I want to give up that and pursue this? And if I do, how do I do that? Because that was a big step, and that I did. Three of your favorite films of all time. Um, well, gosh, let me think about that. Um, I got to tell you, I'm a big fan of Deadpool. <laughs> I thought it was a terrific movie. I it really is loved a, it. It's a wonderful film. It, it was. It was again very well structured, very inventive, you know, took risks, broke the rules, but within that universe, consistent as it could be. Mm -hmm. I love that film. Um, you know, I, I loved, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, Field of Dreams. Oh, so good. It's a wonderful film. Um, you know, going way back, I think uh, Lawrence of Arabia was probably, you know, one of my all-time favorites. Just superbly directed beautifully shot uh excellent Acted, acting. written yeah, yeah. Everything, everything it's and and as far as you know kind of a an epic that we don't see a lot of today anymore um you know young every young filmmaker should study that film you know forward and backwards and sideways i i'd say those are three of them i mean good, you know there's many more yeah, of course but yeah those, tons of, i mean you know if a comedy something about mary i think was brilliant i thought uh, bridesmaids was terrific and then i love the woody allen stuff so yeah. Now, can you tell me a little bit about your book, uh, Process to Product? Unfortunately, no. Uh, I'm okay. not allowed. No. <laughs> uh, that, I, I started uh, that because I, uh, partly out of, out of the concept of, you know, Sid Field, I felt was a fantastic book, but I thought that a lot, I saw a lot of writers getting um, kind of uh, straitjacketed by the concept of, oh, you have this structure and you have to fit into it. And then with Hero with a Thousand Faces, I thought almost the opposite. It's a great concept in terms of how do you evolve character and, and a journey, but there's no real kind of, you know, pinpoints to say, how do I get there? So I wanted to give writers two things. I wanted to give writers the freedom to explore within a structure without being straitjacketed and yet allow them uh, a structure that if they got lost, they could come back to. So that was the the impetus. And it uh, came out of, uh, for 10 years I taught at UCLA Extensions. And uh, all of my classes were online. And I'd written all of my, my coursework. So it was taking that, uh, all of that information and kind of, you know, molding it over the course of a decade or two to come up with, with the book. And, you know, I wanted it to be easy to read, clear to understand, and specific, and I, I think I succeeded in that. And where can people find you and your work? Um, they can find me uh, on my website at brianherskowitz.com uh, or at horrorequityfund.com. Mm -hmm. And then the book, you can get at Amazon. It's readily available there. And there's also a link from my, my website if you wanna go there. And Great, and, and I'll put it in the show notes as well. Brian, thank you. It's been an enlightening conversation. Yes, a lot of fun. So thanks and for back anytime. Thanks for coming on.